scripture. Uh, we also, we just talked about the prophecies, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, and it was also written to a Gentile audience, so we would be considered the Gentile audience. Uh, and we're closer to Christ's return, uh, Christ's return, and so we need to know how to navigate our world uh, with all the challenges that come with our faith. So uh, we're going to get into it. And uh, chapter 3, if you want to open your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, that is fine. We have it on the screen, so you're in luck. And uh, we will start there. Um, we, we shift our attention from Daniel. The first two chapters are about Daniel. And we shift our attentions to three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, when I talk about this story, many of you, if you've grown up in church at all as a child, you will know that you probably watched the famous Veggie Tales story. Anybody? Anybody with me? Some of you watched the Veggie Tales? Oh, man, those are the best. You know, they got the theme song, the bunny, the bunny, oh, I love the bunny. Some of you are looking at me like, you are crazy. Uh, but anyway, no, I love Veggie Tales. They, they always did the best that, you know, kind of having uh, a visual for biblical stories and all those things. So it was pretty awesome. Uh, but before we dive into the story, I want to tell a bit of a story for myself. Now, this, this story you're going to find is a lot about courage. And so that's the theme we're going to go with. Uh, but here's the thing. Before I got married, uh, I had to plan a bachelor party. And uh, these bachelor parties, you know, I, I, I'm a little different this way because I wanted to go back to Ottawa to see the infamous Ottawa Senators versus the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm. <laughs> I'm a Sens fan, so if you're a Leafs fan sitting here, you're already quivering, you're already a little angry. This is good. I got, I got your attention. That's good. Uh, but we, but I, but I wanted to go all the way to Ottawa watch a Sens Leafs game. It didn't turn out so well, and uh, the Sens lost. But however, uh, at the end of the game, we were up in the upper deck, and so we had to walk down the stairs. And unbeknownst to us, there was a, a couple people on either side uh, bickering and bantering, kind of yelling at each other, calling each other names, and all of a sudden. Push, they're pushing each other and then fists are flying. Like, we're just like, uh, what do we do now? Like, are we going to be okay? And uh, I, I, I don't know if this is foolish, if it's stupid. I don't know what I was thinking. But I thought, you know what would be a great idea? I'm going to intervene in this moment. <laughs> One verse five. Because <laughs> I didn't think about it. Maybe all their attention that was on each other might fall onto me. And now I'm the enemy. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I, I had to get in there, I had to intervene, and fists are flying, I'm like, guys, it's okay, it's okay. And uh, they're like, yeah, you know what, it, I guess it is okay. Lots of alcohol, so they're, 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 you know, they're not really with it. And, uh, and so I, I broke up the fight, and my friends were like, you're crazy, what are you doing getting in the middle of that? I, I like, did you know that we were literally like blocking all their like fists that were just swinging for your head? Like, I, I wasn't aware of it, but I was like, well, it could have turned out a lot worse, so I had to do something. Uh, it was a bit of a, a moment of courage that I had to kind of muster up in this moment. And uh, I, I, I don't know about you, but have you ever been in that situation where you had to muster some courage? Like, you had to, you had to almost, like, just speak out and say something that you knew wasn't maybe the popular opinion? Or maybe, yeah, you had to intervene in that fight. Uh, you had you had to make arrangements, uh, do the right thing, and you had to intervene in what seemed like an impossible situation. Anybody ever been there? Yes. Yes, and it's uh, it can be very intimidating. And I think some of it is because many times taking courage can be hard to come by, because in the back of our minds we know it may cost us something. It may cost us money. It may cost us friendships. It may cost us promotion, whatever. It could cost you anything. And so I believe the story that we're about to read is all about courage. And uh, courage that definitely could come at a big cost. If you know the story, you already know where I'm going with this. But I want you to leave encouraged and confident, knowing that with God, you can be courageous through just about any situation. And uh, so we are going to dive right into Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. And uh, so we will go to verse 1. 
And the story goes like this. This is not going to be your VeggieTales version. So if you expected to see VeggieTales up on the screen telling the story, I I'm sorry. I, I really do apologize. I'll make sure to make better accommodations for next time. Anyway, all right. So let's get into Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. King Nebuchadnezzar, we know, is the king at this time. He made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Uh, we know Babylon is this great city, fortified walls, and uh, they are basically ahead of their time. And this gold statue is about 90 feet tall for us today. It's pretty big. Uh, he then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So he's just getting everybody on staff. He's like, guys, we're going to set up this big golden image. Uh, so the prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then they herald loudly, the herald loudly, <laughs> I am tripping over my words. They loudly proclaimed, uh, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the basically guitars, piano, all drums, okay? Just to simplify it for you, okay? Um, but they, they're playing all these instruments and all kinds of music. And you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. This is, this, is, this is quite an unprecedented moment. All of a sudden, King Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel has literally just interpreted his dream, decides, you know what would be a great idea? Let's, let's just set up this big golden statue for everybody to worship. That would be pretty cool, eh? Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to worship, like, we, we know that worship... Uh, it can be songs, it can be hymns, but it can also just be a way of living. And, uh, and in this moment, uh, everybody, nations of every language, right, that everybody's been taken from their home and they've been put in this spot in Babylon where they have to ascribe to worshiping this golden image. It was no problem to have your own religion, your own beliefs, your own uh, gods, but you had to worship this golden image. And we're reminded that in scripture that no one is worthy of worship except god we're, we were reminded of this in exodus 20 it says that you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below you should not bow to them or worship them for i the lord am a jealous god see god is a jealous god he loves he loves his children and to see somebody else worshiping an idol uh, is not going to fly with him. And so being a Jewish person, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are far from home. And so they would know the scriptures and would be reminded of this, that no, we, we can't worship this idol. We have, we only worship Yahweh. And, uh, and so the question becomes in our own lives, who or what does culture say is worthy of our worship? Because back then it was this big golden image, but for us today, what are the idols in our culture that they say we should say are worthy of worship? I would say that we have a problem with love of self, uh, that we're so self-obsessed and we in some way worship ourselves. We think we're the epitome and the center of the world. And trust me, I've been there. Okay, I, I know, I know. Uh, but uh, and, and even when we think about famous celebrities, our culture tells us that our famous celebrities and sports athletes and those who are just extremely talented and elite in our society, we should put our attention on them. We should pay the money to go see their shows. Nothing wrong with that. But we almost do whatever we can to aspire to be just like them. We know the words of their songs. We know how many touchdowns they got. We know how many goals they scored. We know what movies they were in. We know almost just about more about these people than we do about our own Bible. It's crazy. Uh, even our culture says that we should love money. How many advertisements do you see about gambling? That we're supposed to just give our money away and suddenly we'll just be winners. Our life will be great. We can buy that mansion we always wanted, that pool, whatever it is. We're obsessed with money. We love money. And we should just only care about our possessions, temporary things. 
But in reality, God is really the only thing that will last beyond all those things. And so we have to fight in this. We have to almost navigate this tension in our culture of what is worthy of our worship. Because, in fact, I don't know if you knew, we were actually created to worship. Uh, God began by creating human beings, Adam and Eve. And he, there was perfect relationship between them in the Garden of Eden. And to this day, we've turned our back on him and we've decided to worship other things. We go to verse 6 to 7. And it says this, whoever does not fall down and worship... And this is the decree will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, guitar, piano, drums, uh, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshiped this image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Crazy. See, here's here's the thing that I that I discover is that people will worship idols out of fear. I mean, the stakes are pretty high. He made it very clear. If you don't worship this golden image, you're getting thrown in the fiery furnace. Plain, simple, done. Obviously, for us today, that's not the case. However, I think we do perhaps worship idols unknowingly because we're fearful of losing the temporary things that we love so much, that we worship. We're, we're, we're concerned about the money. We're concerned about our identity and being like certain people. We're concerned about all these things and we worship idols out of fear. King Nebuchadnezzar is inciting fear basically into people saying that you better worship this. And people, all the nations of every, every person in every nation uh, bows before this statue. They're willing to give up their identity they compromise their beliefs, and and uh, and the stakes are high. Un- like like, picture yourself there. Would you be willing to lose your life for what you believe? I I don't know. It's it, it's hard. It's hard for me to even say if I could even have that courage to disobey the order. See, a question we should ask ourselves is: What is the one thing you fear losing most? Because because the relationship with God, you don't have to fear. You, you know that everything is eternal. But when it comes to the temporary things of life, things come and go. They, they, they vanish from our hands. And so it could be, again, position, money, friends, influence, all these things. You're fearful of losing them. And so you just direct all your attention and time and worship towards those things. So Nebuchadnezzar, he... he Puts this decree out that you will worship this golden image, if not, into the fire. Crazy. We get to verse 8. It says, At this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of all these instruments and music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whatever does not, whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing fire, a furnace. Okay, already established. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who literally pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had... Uh, different names before they were enslaved into Babylon and taken. Uh, and I won't go through them, but Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, I think I'm pronouncing those right, but if I'm not, uh, well, you'll just have to Google it and you know do the Google voice thing. Uh, anyway, but these three men are appointed uh, because of Daniel. Daniel was able to interpret the dream, and, uh, and so King Nebuchadnezzar was going to put Daniel... Uh, as the as in charge of over all the affairs of Babylon, and by Daniel's request, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are put in that role. And so these are not just three chumps; these are three guys who are basically running things at the time, almost. And uh, they are just uh, in big roles of position. They they it's not like as if they just showed up and they're like, oh, we're just here. I don't know what's going on with the music, but all right. They're not three chumps. They're definitely in a position of power. And they're refusing to bow down to this image. 
it could almost be seen as insulting at this point. Uh, based on the scripture we just read, it's amazing that they were able to stand courageously before men and the king. Like, just think about that for a second. Everybody else has bowed down to this image, and these three men are just standing there. That would be like, let's say, for example, right? Everybody says, all right, church, sit down. And three, three of us are just standing there. It's a little, a little awkward, isn't it? Uh, but you can imagine that th this is not just, just, just a small crowd of people like we are today. This is like many, many nations, many people within the surrounding area. Everybody's bowing down, and these three men are just standing there. And they're standing with courage. Why were they able to stand so courageously in such tense moments? Because they know what's going to happen. They're standing there, and they know that following this, they will be thrown into a furnace of fire. Now, I'm sure in this moment, maybe some of us would probably stand there, realize that, oh, maybe I made a mistake, and probably back down. We probably would, okay, sorry, I, I, and then just bow down, right? But they don't do this. I, I don't imagine that courage for them happened overnight. I think the courage that they showed by standing there was cultivated through learning to fear God and not man. Learning to love God, learning to obey his commands. This wasn't just an overnight thing. Think, think about anything you do in life. You don't just wake up one morning and all of a sudden you're a great athlete. You don't wake up one morning and all of a sudden you know you're ready to take on the world, right? And, and uh, we know that from superhero movies. The courage they show. They have to kind of figure things out first before they can really kick some butt. Uh, but in any case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand there in these tense times knowing how high the stakes are. It couldn't have felt good being alone. And uh, Deuteronomy 10:12. this would be years, years before Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. But this is a great reminder for, probably for them it was, and for us today. But it says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. All your soul. They learned how to fear God because they, it was just ingrained in them that this, God is the only one worthy of our worship. He's the only one we serve. He's the only one we fear. Because no man can do to any extent, any extreme, that God can't reward us for in our courage. We can stand and know that God is with us. It even says this in Deuteronomy 31.6, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. I'm sure these are things that are coming to their mind as they're standing there that, no, 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 we, we can be strong and courageous because we know that God is with us in these tense moments. See, even while we may face oppositions from all sides, we can have peace in our hearts knowing that if God is for me, who can be against me? That is something that we can hold on to. So go, continuing in the story, we get to verse 13. So these officials, they've come to the king and said, hey, you see those three Jewish guys? Yeah, they, they're not even paying attention to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. They're not paying attention to your gods. They don't, they don't care. And so in verse 13, it says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? It's kind of, it's kind of interesting because King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he's appointed them. So it's kind of an awkward moment. It's like, really? Like, guys, seriously? You're not, you're not bowing down? Like, maybe this is just some sort of mistake. Uh, maybe we can figure this out. He's, so he reiterates it. He says, now when you hear the sound of all these instruments and music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. We're on the same page. Everything's going to be okay. It's almost like he's just making sure. He's like, okay, as long as you do this, we're, we're okay. But then he says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown imme immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? 
Oh, oh, oh. This is where the rubber is starting to hit the road. Things are getting real. The king has now personally confronted them and said, you need to bow down to this. Otherwise, this is exactly what's going to happen in a few moments. And here's how they respond. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. Not, not all at the, the same time, okay? It's not like the three of them were just like, oh, like they're not saying it all in the succinct words, like all three of them. But they replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Oh, okay. Do you, do, you want to, do you want to say something too? Yeah, yeah, I'll say something. Uh, if we are thrown in the blazing furnace, your majesty, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Those are some bold words. Not only is God going to deliver us, he's going to deliver us from you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Eight, verse 18 says, but even if he does not, this is astonishing, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Oh, my heart would be beating a million miles an hour if I said this to, say, the prime minister, the president, I don't know, like, just the higher ups. Like, you don't, you don't say that to the king. You just don't. That's a death sentence. And their faith is being put to the test. And like I said, at this moment, they could have apologized. They could have said, oh, I'm so sorry, your king. I, I, I didn't know we were supposed to bow right now. I, I didn't know that, the, that we couldn't just stand here and maybe raise our arms or do something. I, like, they could have just apologized and reasoned with him and said, you know what? We will bow. We will bow. So sorry. I, I didn't mean any trouble. But, he, but they don't do that. They double down on their courage and they say, uh, we're not going to do it. In fact, God's going to deliver us. Even if he doesn't, we're willing, to, we're willing to live with the consequences. We're willing to go to the point of death because we decide that we will not worship the God's, uh, the image of gold that you've set up. It's eye-opening, especially for us to read this, because sometimes we think that we, our prayers are based on, our, or our faith in God is based on the outcome of our lives. That if good things are happening in our lives, God is good. That's good. If bad things are happening, God's not with me. God's not for me. And so in this moment, it's eye-opening because they're not concerned about the outcome whatsoever. They're willing to die because they worship God and God alone. They know that God had done wondrous miracles. You can read about them in, in the Torah. There, there's lots of times where God would intervene and set the Israelites free, that he would intervene and deliver them from impossible circumstances. But even with all this in mind, they're still going to be faithful to the end. Like, isn't that inspiring? My question for us today is, how do you respond when your faith is tested? How do you respond when your faith is tested? See, you can't be confident in God if you don't know him intimately. You can't know that you have a firm foundation without actually reading the word and knowing him, knowing his voice, and actually being able to live it out. Again, this courage doesn't happen overnight. See, your faith is only going to stand the test of time when you've cultivated a relationship with God. And so just know that in life, your faith is going to be tested. You are going to go through some fires as we're just about to read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So verse 19, we just read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego aren't having it. They're like, we are standing firm with our answer and we are not going back. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious, verse 19, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. His attitude toward them changed. He probably thought very highly of them, but now all of a sudden they, they just totally turned their back on this decree that they should worship this image of gold. So he ordered the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. 
He must have been burning with some anger. No pun intended. <laughs> some of you got it. Some of you are still waking up. It's okay. Coffee will get you. Uh, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into this blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Radchak, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Something we should observe uh, a couple things is that they were bound, like tied up. Like, they're getting thrown into the fire. What do you think they're going to do? Break free and just, like, run out of there? Like, it's pretty, it's a pretty hot fire. Like, you know, you roast your marshmallows, sometimes mine come out black. Yeah, that's what would have happened anywhere near the fire. But these soldiers, they get near the fire and they just die immediately. On the spot. Done. Finished. Crisp. Like bacon. Um, they're done. I don't know why I have bacon on the mind. Anyway, maybe I'm just hungry. Uh, but the, 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 they're just done. They're, they're finished. They've died. And these men, the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just fall into the fire. And then there's like this moment of silence. And I'm sure everybody thought, oh, this is over. It's done. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors. Because I'm sure he probably, he, it was done. He's He's at a safe distance because King Nebuchadnezzar, he can't, he can't get his, his, uh, you know, his, his nice hair burnt, okay? It's going to be still looking good at this point. So he's, he's way up here. He's observing. And he's amazed because he was about to turn around. But then out of the corner of his eye, he sees that something is a little off. Something's changed. Something isn't quite what it seems like. He says, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Just a big look of confusion on his face. They replied, uh, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. Not three, four. Four minus three is one. Well, now we're doing math. Okay. Um, so, so he says, there's four men. That doesn't make any sense. There were three. We put them in there. We all saw it with our own eyes. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. This is important. Unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the sons of God. I have reason to believe that this is just not any figure. It's not just a shadow. This is Jesus himself in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Long before he is incarnated and is on earth as a human being like that is just crazy like pre because because if you believe that god has been existent all throughout time that means that jesus was pre-existent in this historical setting that he is actually in the fire god was with them in the fire do you know here's a question for us do you know what it's like for god to be with you do you know that feeling? Do you know his voice? Do you know what it's like for God to be in the fire of opposition that you're going through? And maybe some of you can actually testify. You say, yeah, I remember when God, God walked me through that. Right? Some of us can say that. And, uh, and so it's just, it's just astonishing that in this moment, they should be burnt. They should be dead. But they're walking around and they're, they're, there's some scholars who say they were praising God. That they were actually lifting praises. That, like, that doesn't add up. Now, some of us, if you're a skeptic, you might say, well, this is just a fairy tale. If you know the God of the Bible, who created the world, who parted the Red Seas, who gives visions and dreams, who can heal people, raise people from the dead, then this is very possible. This is very possible for God. In fact, he is a God of the impossible as we're about to read even further in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar, he then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. 
Sorry, what? They just, they just walked right out. And what's crazy is that at this time, everybody crowds around because they're just like, hold on, did I just see what I think I just saw? You saw it, right? This, this isn't just, I'm not tripping. I'm not, I'm not being delusional here. This is, this is happening, right? And so they saw the fire that, uh, that it had not harmed their bodies in any way, nor was a hair of their head singed. And I gotta say, mine's looking good today. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> their, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. That is all impossible. That can't be possible. There's literally nothing that would suggest that the fire even touched them or was near them. You want to talk about a God who can do the impossible, there you have it. People witnessing it. This is a miracle. And so maybe for us today, do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? That there are situations and maybe situations of opposition or you're just going through a fire yourself and do you believe that God could do that for you? Because I believe he can. I've seen him do it. And there are times where even we think about like Moses, for example. Like I think about how the burning bush was on fire, right? Because he was showing, he was revealing himself to Moses and this bush was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. And just in the same way, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not consumed. And I believe that whatever fiery situation you're in, God won't let you be consumed either. In fact, he wants to deliver you from it. Does it mean that he always will? Sometimes his will decides that maybe it's best we go through the fire as opposed to being delivered from it. So here's what it says next in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own. If you have a Bible, just highlight that. Like the fact that they were willing to trust God and put their lives on the line. And so in verse 29, it says, Therefore, King Nebuchadnezzar speaking, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. No other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is just a crazy turn of events. The tables have completely turned. At one point, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are fearing for their lives, but they, they have this trust, they have this uh, un, impenetrable confidence in their God that he was able to deliver them and they were willing to die no matter how high the stakes. And for us, we need to be reminded that God can turn any circumstance for our good and his glory. When we trust and obey God, no matter how high the stakes might be for us, he's faithful to deliver us, but he's also faithful to entrust us with more. I can't say for sure that every circumstance you go, for, go through that God is going to somehow deliver you from it. But he's going to walk through it with you. So what, so what can we apply from all this? Because to some of us this sounds like a fairy tale. It sounds impossible. You can't wrap your mind around it. So what can we take away from this story here today? First thing is this. Is that we have to identify what has our worship. We have to identify the things that has our worship. What are the things that you hold on to, that you give all your attention, your love, your adoration to? And it could be, again, it could be many things, but that is just a question for you to, to ponder on. Are you fearful of losing the temporary things in your life, or are you fearful of God? 
a healthy fear of God, a reverence for God that says, God, I'm willing to put everything on the line for your namesake. That I, I believe so truly that God is with me, that he's for me, that it doesn't matter what I have, what, what position that I might uh, be in, that if it comes down to it, I'm going to speak out when I need to speak out. I'm going to be that person that stands up courageously. I think I think one thing that I've realized is that we that we can be formed into the likeness of what we love most. Like I think about Taylor Swift fans. Anybody Taylor Swift fan? So yeah, Victoria, see, I love it, love it. This isn't to harp on Taylor Swift fans. I'm just using it as an example. But but uh, any any celebrity, any anything like that, uh, you can almost again. I said it before. You can become like that person, that thing, right, that you love so much. You, you know the songs, all of a sudden you're talking like them, you're becoming like them, it's crazy. Uh, but anyway, I'm not saying that about you, Victoria, just, just so you know, I just, just want you to know that. Um, but uh, in, in any case, sometimes the things that we love and adore the most, we become more like them, and we have to be careful because anything that is other than God is is obviously not good for our faith. Uh that's the second thing, is that once we've identified our, uh, what has our worship, we have to prepare our faith for testing. This is, this is something I realized about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that when the test came for them to stand courageously, they didn't cower in fear. They, again, they didn't apologize. They said, you know what, we're going to stand with courage. And uh, most of you will know, if you've lived any length of time, that life throws you pop quizzes. It doesn't allow you to, to say, okay, on this date, there's going to be a, 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 there's going to be a trial. There's going to be a, a situation that I'm going to have to navigate, and uh, it's going to happen on this day. Yeah. Life has a way of throwing pop quizzes where it will catch you when you're least expecting it. When, when, when everybody else is doing the same thing, and you have to stand there and be ready to stand with courage. See, I, again, having a strong faith in God doesn't happen overnight. And so you need to prepare your faith for testing. You need, again, do you know God's voice? Do you, do, you, do you have that intimate relationship that at any point, if the situation called for, you could stand and say, I will stand for God no matter what the culture tells me. We sang about it earlier, how there's joy in the house of the Lord, and we won't be quiet. It's easy to do it in here, but is it easy to do it out there? Will we be quiet out there? Will we be silent when the culture is having their way with things, and the evil, the immorality, whatever it is? Now, again, don't get me wrong. We're supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to love our culture and love people. But by the same token, we can't sit there in silence and let things be and go along with it. We have to be willing to be courageous. And again, courageous, being courageous will cost you something. Following Jesus will cost you something. Have you counted the cost? Some, some, some of you, 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 you haven't, and maybe, and maybe that's for another time, but some of us who have been in church and we, we say we follow Jesus, we love Jesus, we'll, can we stand courageously for him when the time comes? It's a challenge for us because, I, I, again, when we're not on a firm foundation, we don't know what the Word of God says and we're not living by it. We're like people living on a house in sinking sand that's going to be wiped away by any storm. So prepare your faith for testing because you never know when it might come, when you have to be in the fire of opposition and you have to stand for your faith. Number three. Confront the idols in your life and in your culture. This is probably the hardest one. Confront the idols in your life and in the culture. Again, it will cost you something to confront these idols, whatever it may be. It, it, might, it might be the love of money. It might be, you know, you're just on your phone all the time and you're giving your attention. It may be sports. It may, whatever it is. Instead, instead of taking the time to adore and love and worship all those things, maybe take time in aside 
to give your attention and time to God. It, 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 it is a difficult thing because our culture tells us to bow to everything other than God. You and I can't afford to be passive in this culture anymore. Because people want to know that what you believe is actually a real thing. That it's not just something you do on a Sunday. That it's not just something that you, you, you do for show. That it's actually something real that you live for. That you're willing to even die for. And, and, it's, and it's, it's humbling because you think about where we live in Canada. That we're so fortunate to be able to come to church and be able to, to live out our faith. And yet in lands uh, far from us that if you're found out to be a Christian, you're imprisoned or you're killed. And, uh, and I guess it's a reminder for us that we live in a foreign land today. Even though we live at home, we're in Canada, we're comfortable, we're still living in a foreign land. Are we willing to live uncomfortable? Are we, living, are we willing to be courageous and confront the idols in our own lives and in the culture around us? And lastly, pray over what you can't control. So, we just talked about confronting idols and confronting the idols in our culture. That is something you can control. You actually have the decision to confront those things in your life that know that God should take the position of. However, pray over what you can't control. And what was something that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego couldn't control was the outcome. I don't know about you, but in life, I get worried about outcomes all the time. I'm worried how the money's going to work out. I'm worried how this relationship is going to navigate itself. I'm worried about a lot of things. And so instead of being anxious and worried and letting that consume my thoughts, remain faithful. Just remain faithful in your prayer life. Ask God, God, would you, would you, would you calm my anxious thoughts and let me submit every thought and obey every thought to obey you. God is faithful through it all, and it's going to be hard to see it in the moment, but he always turns circumstances for good, just like he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and again Abednego. It's not always the case. However, you can be certain that God is with you. And so some of us, we, we don't know what that feeling's like, but I guarantee you, as you draw close to God, as you draw close and you ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you will know that he's with you. I can guarantee you that. So those are the four things that we can apply. Identify what has your worship. Prepare your faith for testing. Confront the idols in your life and in culture. And pray over what you can't control. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.